As Native Americans, we recognize that spirit is the essential link between everything that has life. Birds, humans, four-leggeds, and trees, we are all related. Our tribal ancestors have passed on the wisdom of this sacred link, and because of this knowledge, we Native Americans have been asked in this series to share the implications of our cultural heritage and spiritual relationship with the trees and forests. In fact, we pray to God the Creator through the trees in our ceremonies, such as the sun dance. In this program, Continuing Traditions, tribal people from the Southwest talk of the spirit of the trees through the voices of their sacred drums and flutes, their looms and weavings, their medicines, stewardship of the land, and their cultural interdependence with the trees and forest. I've been walking this path for, I think, since I was, I was a, a young child. Because I grew up and learned the art of drum making from my dad. You know, I've been making uh, drums for quite a few years, but still, Every day when I start peeling or whatever, I will come to a situation there's gonna be a challenge. I said, no. And I'll just keep thinking, what, what, was, what did my dad say about this point? And if I really think, he'll come to me. You know that the gathering part is of the wood, whether it be cottonwood or whatever. It's part of that uh, spiritual, to me, is because you're going out into that part of uh, nature and what nature has to offer. You know, uh, you just don't want to take. You take only what you need, what you want. You know, and so that's when you say your your prayers or whatever. You know, so that before you before you gather. <clears throat> or take because what you're also going to be doing and it's sort of like a an, an ethic an ecology or the way we look at the the, the world um, what I'll be doing is grabbing that piece of wood a lot of times that's going to be some termites or whatever there's some animals there's some creatures living there so I'm going to be disturbing that that little ecosystem there and I'm going to be taking it home I, I have to look at it in a little bit more sensitive way. Now I'll, I'll be talking to the spirit of those creatures there, you know. Don't want to be disturbing your home just to be disturbing, but I want to take part of this home of yours because it's now going to be turned into something sacred. It's going to be turned into a drum. And your home now is going to be something that's going to keep on it's going to be used in a ceremony for my people or some other people. Continuing our tradition through the making of looms, the selection of plants and trees to dye yarns, the weaving of our blankets and rugs is what preserves the culture and strengthens native spirit. Our traditional ways infuse an understanding that trees are a vital link to our past, our present, and our future. Cultural preservation, I believe, can only be done through preserving a lifestyle. And weaving is a lifestyle. It, 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 um, it works with many different elements. It works with natural resources, and it works with agricultural resources, and human resources, and human creativity. 
And in the program, what I do is I work in the tribal communities and community centers where the elders gather. The idea is that through um, reintroducing and working with the elders in, in the textile arts that they will bring it into their youth and renew it to the youth because a lot of the elders have the time to um, not only relearn the art, but also they um, d dedicate a lot of their time to working with the Head Start programs and with the, in the high schools. When we um, want to weave traditionally, we first look to nature. And we, we look to nature and we look to the Creator and creation in the, cre in the Mother Earth and Father Sky. And we look to that first and um, foremost in, in prayer. And then we go into nature and we start um, extracting the elements of our creations. Master weavers and colorists continue to rely on trees and plants for making their yarn combs, looms, dye coloring for their yarns, and of course medicines. All these plants are real special to us Indians, all tribes, um, because uh, sage are all used for uh, some other things like when you get sick you, you use that to uh, drink it or boil it and drink it that will help your, your, your cold too. Uh, my great grandmother was a weaver and my grandmother was a weaver and my mother is a weaver and I'm a weaver. Okay, who's going to be next but next to me that's going to learn how to weave? I said, this is really something to carry on in your life. This is really special to know, to learn and to have it in your, in your mind and, and carry on. I said, this is really life, what, what I learned. I didn't realize all these things, but I, it's really good as a native. We pray to Mother Earth. It's just like your mother, she, she raised you, she takes care of you when you're a child. You take her milk, take care of you, food and everything else. The Mother Earth is just like that. So we need to be thankful and pray for it and take care of it. As tribal people, the attitudes of honor and thankfulness for the Earth Mother is inherent in our cultures. Gratitude is rooted in intuition in awareness and in understanding the bond between ourself and Mother Earth. Our identity, our way of life is so connected to nature. We have places, we see land as very sacred. We see the drum not just a, a, a drum that doesn't have life or the drumstick or the leather. Everything is connected. Same thing like with our dances. When we have buffalo dances, eagle dances, different dances um, across the tribes, you see how we celebrate the interconnectedness of life and how sacred all that life is. And just as uh, Marie mentioned, everything is of our Creator. We have special places that we go to pray um, for songs that certain songs will come to us. And so this sense of connection to the spiritual world is what continues to move us forward and also allows us to see ourselves as grandmothers, as, as grandfathers, or as sister uh, to brother, and, and very special to us. So when, when I come to a place like this and I see traditions continue, it's a real blessing. Native and non-Native people working together in partnership to plant, preserve, and maintain the trees are creating an ethic of ecology for future generations. Sharing their knowledge and resources, Tree New Mexico, a private nonprofit, and the Acoma Pueblo Nation came together to restore Acomita Lake. The site will be returned to its natural condition for fishing, swimming, and a gathering place. Once we get everything up to par and running uh, with Tree New Mexico's efforts to help us with the inter interpretive trails that we have uh, with our xeric type gardening and uh, native trees that we have re replanted and reforested around the lakeshore, 
We've gotten some funding and also some, uh, some help uh, on our reforestation within the Alcamita Lake boundaries here. Some of the trees that we recommended that we plant will be the native type species of trees. Um, we do have existing conifers and junipers within the area here, which, which provide shade for the picnic table area here. And most of the um, people here use a lot of our trees for other purposes, not only for shade. Uh, primarily the pinyon juniper trees will be used for heating uh, the homes, the winter homes. Uh, we have people actually going out logging uh, selected trees which have, you know, um, are ready for harvesting for fuel wood. The Yakima people here believe, you know, we've um, grown with um, the Southwest and our, our location here in, in the Southwest. We've adapted to the type of trees we have, the vegetation, the mountain, the terrain, and what we're able to harvest is of, uh, of big game. Trees uh, have been a big part of uh, my tribal people in a sense of uh, both spiritual and for fuel wood use. Other use of trees that we have will, like I mentioned, will, are medicinal. Uh, some of them are for colds, some of them are for ailments in certain parts of your body. And uh, we all have a purpose for every tree, almost has a purpose for our use in our daily life too. Um, everything from the shrubbery to uh, the forbs, uh, to the rocks. The tradition of Indian basket weaving is passed on from one generation to the next. The weaver's knowledge of when, where, and what to gather is shared. Access to important trees, grasses, and reeds has become a challenge for Indian basket weavers today. Traditional gatherers must be resourceful in locating and collecting. Over the years, Land ownership by a dominant society has taken over and gathering rights for weavers are being denied. In many areas, the grasses, reeds, and other basket weaving materials are being sprayed with pesticides by road maintenance crews. Since basket weavers use their saliva to soften and shape the grasses and reeds, an alarming number of Native American basket weavers are developing mouth and throat cancer. Helping maintain our culture through the preservation of traditional practices, weavers like Julia Parker, when gathering for baskets, take and use only what is necessary. They know how to select and gather by aerating the soil and using only what they have pruned. In, uh, in our baskets that we have here, you'll see a red color going through the design in the basket. And this has... Uh, the California redbud, which which can is a tree and also a shrub, and then we have the willows in a white background, and then the willows for the straight sticks going up and down in the basket. Some people uh, relate to us or to us basket weavers that you're killing the plants, you know, and I think about that, you know, and I think well, uh, to them. It would be, they would think like that. But to us as basket weavers, no, we're helping that plant to grow. We're helping it to become strong. In basketry, when I was learning how about the red bud, a lot of the fiber would be given to me from the old people, the weavers. And their strings used to be three and four feet long. And I used to wonder how in the world they would get so long. It's because they would leave that shrub alone for a couple of years and it would get a chance to grow and give us a beautiful brownish red color that you can see in, in this basket here. I've um, 
thought about that a lot and so I've done some experimenting of my own. I've gone down and I've completely uh, cut down a shrub uh, all the way to the bottom and then I think well it's gonna it, it'll come back and it does and it comes back almost twice as long as it did the year before. Protecting the health of our rural and urban forests is only possible through carefully tried thoughtfully planned land management practices like the Maidu Stewardship Program in Northern California. Although our rural and urban forests are managed differently, land practices developed by Native Americans over centuries of involvement with the land offer an opportunity for reliable leadership in developing healthy forests and responsible stewards of the land. As we were thinking about what we can do for the community, one of the things we thought about is our culture, the Maidu culture. It's not as strong as it used to be. It's a land-based culture, and we, don't, we didn't have any land where we could do things as a community. So in that way, this project is very important because it's bringing us back to the land and giving us a place where we can not, not only do land management, but Maidu land management, and that's through the Maidu traditional environmental knowledge. What we have here are trees that are, are trying to find their place, trying to find some balance for the forest. Sometimes humans come in and we need to meet our own needs too. And so in this case, for us, the Maidu people, we would thin to pre for preference leaving that oak so that the oak can get more sunlight, it'll spread out because we need the acorns. And so in an instance like that, we might just thin. They don't, the trees right now, they're all struggling. And, this root we would use for basket material. So you take that root out and then the, that plant would die, but what you do in that process, you're aerating the soil and you're making it softer. And then all kinds of, the, the main root would still be there because all of these ferns are connected, this type of fern, by their roots. Every time you dig it and you make the soil better, you get longer and straighter roots. But then also they're putting out more roots and they're getting more ferns. And so somehow it just seems that it works out just perfectly for all of us. That's how we would maybe work with that fern. Humans have a really, a great potential to be something very good for the forest. And we see that in the past, humans in this area, I'll talk about the Maidu, they worked with the plants and the resources, the animals and so on, such that some people have said the plants came to depend on these human disturbances and so on because of the time that went past when they were working and living together. So now, like I was talking about the fern earlier, humans can do that, but only, I think it's not happening without us. We can make that fern healthier. We can, just by using it, by using it with respect, we can make it healthier. If we come out into the forest and we look at all these trees, we can actually help these trees to grow. We can do that as humans, whereas the bear, he doesn't think about it, he can't do it. What really holds us together is that we do have a vision for this area. And because this knowledge, traditional environmental knowledge and land management goes back so long, it's, it's at some point maybe all of us have it in our hearts and we have the desire to do it and that's what's pushing us forward all the time. Traditional flutes have been used throughout human history to awaken the spirit and comfort the heart. Native American flute makers and musicians instinctively know they must become the instrument, allowing the spirit of the tree to shape the instrument, and the spirit of the instrument to become the music. As far as the flute is concerned, that's, that's an instrument of the heart, I believe, because uh, traditionally in the old, uh, in different tribal customs, it was basically a courtship flute, and so it was an instrument that was played from the heart. So, uh, and since it hit me there being cedar, I, I pretty much like working with cedar now. Um, it was shared with me that uh, the length of the flutes were determined uh, by, the, by the arm, underneath the arm to the bend of the elbow was the determining of that part. And as you can see, there's holes in this thing. And the, the flutes of this determined to that first hole. And then they usually use a thumb space, but I narrowed it down.
Again, hand finger to the first hole in the flute and thumb spacing. Again, hand plus two fingers determined the, the end of the flute. And that seemed to come out to be where it needed to be. The bore here, when I put it back together, was determined either by the finger or the thumb. So when people did that, the flutes usually came out either to an F or to an F sharp flute. Uh, so, and I pretty much stay in those areas now with an F and F sharp flute. The wood has like spirit or whatever you want to call it, or it just has a particular feel to it. Um, whether it's going to be a good flute or if it's going to be a heavy flute. The other part of it too is that I don't just do flutes. I, uh, I wait for, for when my heart is right or when I'm feeling good because I don't want to transpose those kind of feelings into the instrument either. It gets to where I don't even think anymore. You know, it's just like I'm just doing my hands work and they do what they do. There's, it's, it's like they know the process and I don't have to tell them, okay, we're going to do this now. They, they just seem to work themselves. They know what, what needs to be done next, what goes on. This one came out into an, a tune to an E, it sounds like. I often tell my audiences when I'm playing, I, I always honor the trees. I always honor this piece of wood that's alive, that has spirit. And to me, it's such, I feel privileged to be able to have been chosen to play this instrument. Uh, whether it's culturally correct or not, you know, it, I feel honored to have been to, given the desire to make the trees sing, to make them talk to uh, give them life um, and maybe tell a story about, about how they feel, you know, what the beauty that's in there, in this piece of wood. And it's really hard to explain. It's, um, it's a sense of connection with not only my world and my planet, the earth, mother, but a special affinity for, for the trees, for the, the ones that grow out of the ground and out of the mother. And it's just something that's been in my heart forever. So to be able to give them life is such an honor, such an absolute honor. Indigenous language is really fascinating in the sense that it's equivalent to our um, scientific journals, um, but it's passed on through oral stories and it's also embedded in language. For example, um, the word penstemon in Navajo interprets into um, a word that incorporates the pollinator and the seed disperser. And many of our words in all language, including the Dine Navajo, has words that include a lot about the ecology of that particular species. There are groups that, you know, buy land and remove indigenous people from it to protect biological diversity. And that, to me, is an incredible crime because they themselves have a relationship. It's like taking a flower and its pollinator away from each other, you know, and separating them. You know, there's no sense of there is some type of symbiotic relationship between people and the environment. One of the things that I think is important to address is how today, you know, the dominant culture has separated themselves from the environment discounting themselves and that's not the way it is. There's only about two percent of the original old growth forest left. The forest that, the original forest that existed here in North America. And there's only 
about 1% of the indigenous people left here in North America. I think that in itself says a lot about the loss of our environment and people. About how do we go about resolving this? And when one goes about resolving this, one sits down with the other person and removes the ego and says, I can't live without you as you can't live without me. Or what impacts me impacts you and what impacts and who you are is your family, your extended family, the trees, the rivers, the ocean, the stars and skies and the galaxies. So let's resolve our conflict or let's plan in a sense that we just don't plan just for us that we plan for everything that's behind us, that is part of our whole world. And our world includes not only this physical world, but the worlds that are out there, and also the spiritual world.